Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I am Mihalis Panazopoulos, managing Liberian Registry in Piraeus. Thank you for attending our session, and thank you, Nicolas, for your effort to put together again a highly regarded conference, both on speakers and topics. I would like to thank our panelists for participating in this panel, and I would like to pre briefly present them. To my left is George Plevrakis, Vice President, Global Sustainability, American Bureau of Shipping. Next is Konstantinos Stabedakis, co-founder and CEO of Firma First. Next is Gregory Nakos, partner, Ernest Young, Consulting Services, Greece. And last, Claire Wright, General Manager, Commercial Shipping and Strategy, Shell. So, ladies and gentlemen, while we are still on a recovery process from COVID-19, the economic impact and energy crisis resulting from the Russian-Ukrainian war, the shipping industry so far has been proven flexible, resilient, and adaptable to the political, geopolitical, and regulatory challenges that have been affecting us all. Additionally, the shipping industry is well on her way to adapt new operating principles, implement new technologies and new fuel sources to contribute to and attain the goals of greenhouse gases emission reduction. But the ship owners want practicable and attainable solutions. From the Liberian Registry perspectives, we have seen the last couple of years or so a number of existing vessels and new building orders using LNG as fuel, one or two prototype vessels using ethane as fuels, some ammonia-ready new buildings, very recently some methanol new building orders, a few carbon capsule carriers, some approval in principle projects for CO2 carriers and other vessels, testing of biofuel on existing vessels, projects for liquefied hydrogen, ammonia fuel vessel, methanol new buildings, some efforts on e-fuel, environmentally produced fuel, carbon capsule and storage alternatives. We have also seen attempts to use technology and optimization techniques on board to achieve reduced emissions. How far are we from this potential solution? Are there practicable and physical alternatives to be accepted not only by the shipping industry, but the market itself? Or we are just gathering in conference, nice talk, and that's it. So to hear practicable and attainable solutions on the subject of technology and fuels, I will turn to my panelists and I will start from last, from Claire, on what I consider a major challenge towards decarbonization. Where are we today with respect to alternative fuels, Claire? Thank you. Um, it's good to see a great turnout early in the morning. Um, I will start off talking about the end game, which is the zero carbon fuels that we're looking for in shipping. And I will talk briefly about that pathway, and then I think later we'll talk about the near-term choices that we have as an industry. So the feedstock for future fuels are, is green hydrogen. That is the feedstock. Then there are two pathways that can be taken in terms of fuels. One is a synthetic pathway that leads us to synthetic LNG, the e-fuels, if you like, synthetic LNG, synthetic methane, um, methanol. To unlock that technology requires direct air capture so that the fuel is a net zero fuel, i.e. in burning the fuel through the ship, the emissions from that are offset or compensated for by the carbon that is taken out of the atmosphere in the production of that fuel. So that's one pathway that we are doing the R&D for. And the main challenge with that pathway is the technology to economically and in a carbon efficient way scale that direct air capture technology. That's being worked at the moment. The other pathway leads us to hydrogen or to ammonia. Now, starting off with ammonia, that can be a net zero fuel as long as the um, pilot fuel is of bio origin. The challenge with ammonia, of course, that was referenced in an earlier presentation is the safety. 
Uh, that is under development, and the main challenge is, is the engine technology and also the safety in terms of both the crew on board the vessel and also a, a concern we have is in the bunkering operations and whether they can be made safe and the prevention of any release during bunkering. The other pathway then is hydrogen. Hydrogen requires fuel cells to be able to use because it can't be burnt on its own in an internal combustion engine. So a lot of the R&D we're working on is to unlock those fuel cells. And, and this is where the terminology and the definition of what we mean by zero is critically important because hydrogen is the only absolute zero fuel that is available. So it's very important as we, as for us when we're doing the R&D into unlocking these, as a, if I put a fuel supply hat on, is understanding what the end goal is. Is net zero good enough? Or do we have to go for absolute zero? In terms of our own work, we're prioritizing the direct air capture that unlocks the synthetic pathway, um, because then that enables vessels today to, in our case, we choose LNG as a fuel, to see that pathway that leads from LNG through um, bio blends and the blend of 25% hydrogen into the LNG to a synthetic pathway. And we're also doing a lot of work on fuel cells because that starts to then help us overcome the chicken and the egg of fuel supply and the vessel because the fuel cell can be used with um, hydrogen, it can be used with LNG, enabling the vessel to transition before a global supply infrastructure is available. And I'll stop there for now. Thank you, and I will have George continue from the classification society perspective on the alternative fuel effort. Thank you, Mihaly. Um, I, will, I will expand a bit uh, on um, on the points related to the the colors of the fuels, and I will take. Um, I, of course, I have an occupational bias here when uh, I, I uh, uh, turn to the regulations and the standards that are available, so that we can do this type of evaluation. Um, uh, when we're talking about alternative fuels, I would agree. Yes, we have these different pathways. I would also add that uh, there is a huge interest. Um, with regards to how we use also biomass in order to leverage uh, these molecules and present a uh, sustainable solution for shipping. And each pathway has its uh, challenges and, uh, and opportunities, of course. When we're saying, when we're talking about alternative fuels, uh, uh, the discussion quickly reaches the point where we start talking about colors and defining color and then the carbon factor and what the contribution of its color would actually have to our decarbonization uh, efforts uh, requires standardization, requires a common approach, a common language as we call it, uh, 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 lengua franca, which at this point also to start ask, uh, answering your question about um, uh, some of the challenges we have ahead. Uh, is, is not there. We don't have a, a unified approach as far as how we evaluate this type of solution with regards to their carbon economics or carbon accounting, as we call them. Um, of course, there are solutions that are uh, mature and tested, uh, and uh, I'd like to expand a bit on what you said about the projects that we have already seen. Uh, LNG has been here for quite some time, so, so has methanol. We have seen um, uh, the uprise of methanol projects recently, mainly on certain vessel segments. There are other vessel segments that are still piloting several solutions. Uh, and that actually points to the fact that we are, we are a segregated industry. So one size does not fit all at this point in time. And we are constantly in discussion of a multi-fuel, at least mid-term future. In order for that multi-fuel mid-term future to, um, to flourish and, and, and provide outcomes and results, uh, we need also the other elements of the value chain to scale up. Uh, you need production to scale up. We, we talked about hydrogen and renewable hydrogen, so you need renewable power and you need renewable power to run the electrolyzers and therefore produce uh, the necessary hydrogen that could be used as a token, as, a, as, a, as a, a, a molecule that can be converted to any type of other fuels, either synthetic or e-bio. You have 
uh, you have streams and pathways that combine that with uh, biomass as well, and they're very interesting. If you start thinking about all these pathways, then you also have to consider what are the necessary infrastructure in port to support the vessels that are going to be adopting this type of solutions. And uh, that's why you see that there are uh, there is a need and a discussion about piloting. There is a need and discussion about environments where this can actually be incubated and supported. And you, you could have initiatives that could actually um, bring this whole value chain to a certain maturity level. There are discussions about uh, green corridors, clean energy hubs um, that are supporting more or less, or their, their vision is to support this type of scaling up. At the end of the day, there are a lot of moving pieces still. But what I can say is that what, all the things that I just laid on the table without even attempting to drill down into the details of them uh, have already been part of the day-to-day uh, -day discussion in the shipping companies. And that is, I think, uh, a tremendous victory. We are uh, maturing, we are uh, becoming more and more aware of the things that we have to consider in the decarbonization strategy. And I will end this introductory speech with that positive note, I would say. Uh, thank you, George. So, in summary, we have set the foundation, but we still have some ways and time to go. We'll come back to that. I want to go for to save time on the other part, technology alternatives. And there is talk the last uh, few months. Actually, I see a lot in uh, the shipping magazine and press. Uh, carbon comes with technology, a technology that has been known, has been used in offshore uh, industry. And now there are voices that uh, perhaps we need to consider that on existing vessels and on new buildings. And I will go to um, Constantinos, and I would like him to start uh, commenting on the subject. Thank you, Michalis. Good morning to everyone. Uh, before starting, uh, Nicola and Olga, thank you so much for setting up this uh, nice event, uh, even in a, in a very challenging uh, period. Um, we cannot uh, disregard what just happened in Turkey, and uh, we would like to express uh, our condolences uh, to the Turkish people. And we hope that you know the number of uh, deaths will stay as it is today. Um, I am also Secretary General, MBC Chairman. Thank you for attending the event, distinguished guests, friends. Welcome to the Snow Athens. Can you please take a minute and think, would you ever believe that Athens would be heavily snowed as it is uh, the last two or three years? What about the severe weather phenomena that the global is facing the last many years? Storms, floods, climate refugees is a reality. Well, in my scientific head, hat, um, I'm convinced that the human activity has affected the climate. And greenhouse gases definitely are contributing to this climate change. Of course, how much our industry, the shipping industry, is contributing to the greenhouse gases, to the CO2 production, that's a different discussion, but the reality is, based on the fact, that we're not contributing much. According to the latest figures, we're contributing in the range of uh, 2 to 3 percent of the global CO2 production yearly. So evidently, we are a low carbon footprint industry. However, in today's panel, we'll talk about alternatives. We'll talk about what is the, the portion of responsibility that the shipping industry uh, has on its shoulders to uh, reduce the already low carbon production. So we as a company, Herma First, we believe that there will not be a single solution on all cases. 
the type of vessel, the size, and its um, trade pattern is unique, and it will affect the decarbonization path that each vessel should follow. We divide the path forward to decarbonization in the long term and in the, in the short term. When it comes to the long term, we strongly believe um, that, um, as uh, uh, Claire said, that alternative fuels, greener fuels, and hybrid solution, including um, uh, if, uh, 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 green fuels and uh, electric propulsion, will be the solution. However, we also believe that at least until 2035 to 2040, fossil fuels will be the, 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 the main fuel that the vessels will burn. Therefore, carbon will be produced. Um, so actions towards decarbonization are required. The good news are that today we're operating a relatively young and efficient fleet, which means that minor to or no to minor modifications are required to the existing fleet in order to meet the 2030 requirements. As Pano said earlier, uh, we have uh, uh, sectors like the bar color sector which is already meeting these 2030 requirements and these are the very good news. When it comes to the minor modifications that uh, some SIP uh, or SIP sectors should do, those will mainly uh, focus on operational changes or the installation of the readily available uh, numerous energy saving devices. Uh, PBCFs, half fins, uh, economizers, uh, AMPs are uh, solutions which are already applied. They're mature solutions and they're affecting positively the CO2 footprint meeting the 2030 standards. Now for the older vessels or for the stricter standards which they're about to come, um, carbon capture and storage is a solution. As Michali said earlier, um, this is a mature technology. Noting the, how conservative our, our, our business is, our market is, uh, the shipbuilding technology is following the technological developments which are applied on the um, aviation, automobile industry, or the industry itself. So we have industries like refineries, cement plants, uh, power plants, which are already using carbon capture technologies for several years. So these are the, the, the good news, the second good news. Uh, the marinization, though, of that technology is a headache, but leave this headache on our shoulders, the equipment and technology suppliers. Of course, yes, Fano. Um, I, I, I will come to this. Of course, the carbon capsule technologies as it is today, um, they require the book, a big footprint, not feasible uh, on many existing vessels. But they are energy thirsty, so they're consuming a lot of energy, and they cost too much. However, we've seen in every technology into the market, and weighing now uh, the ballast water maker a technology, uh, the first system that we ever produced back in 2009, it cost us more than half a million and it had a capacity of less than 500 uh, tons per, uh, per hour. Today, the cost of the same or the, the selling price of the same is one third. The same, we, it will apply in carbon capsule technologies when this moment uh, comes. Therefore, I'm positive that there are technologies, there are solutions, but of course, we need some more time for the whole industry to adapt to these new technologies and uh, the new requirements. Thank you. Thank you, Costadinos, for uh, an interesting uh, approach. Uh, but I would like to be more specific on this carbon capsule storage and transportation. And I will go to George Plevrakis from ABS. Um, we have seen also certain uh, ship owners that they are thinking to build the uh, CO2 carriers. 
in order to transport the capsule CO2. So, George, what are the challenges? Where are we? Is there a future on that technology? Well, CO2 carriers are um, a, a kind of a different animal because they serve that carbon, uh, carbon capture value chain that is um, what we expected to also grow. Um, in that value chain, you have a very, very um, uh, uh, fundamental technology, which is, of course, carbon capture. It's not just one technology, it's a family of technologies. There are different types of carbon capturing technologies that are being investigated, on, not only uh, for land use, but also for onboard use. Um, I, I would like to also agree with uh, Constantinos. Um, we do have, as an industry, a uh, a low carbon intensity uh, operation. Um, however, the abatement curves for our industry are, uh, are quite significant. Um, and, and that's what makes this whole thing challenging. And in that, uh, in, in the abatement solutions, we see also carbon capture on board as a, as a, as a very interesting solution. But here's where I, I tend to get a bit nerdy. Um, so just some, r some rough numbers. Uh, for uh, solutions and technologies that are uh, exhibiting a high maturity uh, rate at this point in time, you can consider the following very, very rough calculation or estimation. You, when you burn, let's say, three, uh, one ton of, uh, of uh, MGO or HFO, you emit at about three tons of CO2 based on the conversion factor. Those three tons of CO2 have to be, let's say that they're captured 100%. You never capture that at 100%, but let's say that you capture it at 100%. Um, CO2 uh, in liquid form has more or less the same density as water. And therefore, three tons of CO2 equates to three cubic meters of uh, liquid uh, CO2. Um, multiply that by the uh, consumption that you have on a, let's say, on a daily basis, and then you, you understand what type of uh, optimization gain uh, you have to consider when you are actually considering installing uh, an onboard carbon capture technology. And I emphasize that there's not just one technology, so you don't have to store necessarily the CO2 on board in liquid state. There are technologies that are being developed that um, uh, are suggesting to store CO2 in, in different solid states, even in pure carbon. All of them are very, very interesting technologies. What we really need um, is uh, pilot and experience uh, on, on these type of systems. Uh, there are a couple of pilots ongoing on, on uh, the most, let's say, mature technologies like the uh, amine-based technologies. I'm not going to go into too much te technicalities years here, but um, we are in a, uh, in a learning curve uh, 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 building stage right now, um, as far as the onboard technologies are concerned. Uh, what we've seen generally is that the energy transition will have to uh, also depend on this type of activities, either on land or on board. Uh, we talked previously about the basic element that we will base our future fuels on, which is hydrogen. And we constantly talk about, as ABS, about the hydrogen value chain and how this could support the energy transition. The other value chain is that carbon value chain. You talked about the CO2 carriers that are being discussed. Um, in, in this context, uh, you have all these carbon capturing technologies that are being developed and suggested. From a regulatory perspective, um, carbon capture is not, no pun intended, they're captured in all the regulatory schemes uh, that affect uh, shipping, particularly uh, uh, carbon uh, indexes and uh, carbon intensity indexes. But there are discussions also on IMO and uh, in, a, in a regional perspective. Last but not least, I'd like to mention that um, as far as the technology itself is concerned um, uh, and how this can be installed on board ships, we already have guides, we are looking into them, we are also gaining experience and developing even further the approach and the support that can be given when a vessel needs to uh, consider installing such a, such a technology. Um, but again, I emphasize that the 
uh, uh, reflection of the operation of that technology in the upcoming regulations is still uh, not uh, fully defined and solidified. solidified. Um, and I'd like to see how we discuss during this, uh, this conference also about, we talked a bit about the CII earlier. I don't want to uh, put more uh, fuel in that fire. Interesting discussion. But I'd like to see also discussions about how this type of solutions can be incorporated in the regulations that are coming up, also from a regional perspective, like ETS and fuel EU. So um, I'm, I'm really, really interested to have this discussion with anybody that is uh, looking into that. Thank you, George. So alternative fuel, some technology on car carbon capture, which it seems that it is some way until it can be feasible for shipping, existing shipping. So I will go now to a little different uh, approach. Um, what we do today on the existing fleet is there technology, uh, data collection, analysis, optimization techniques that uh, we have seen that some companies and some consulting firms proposing and to that, uh, I will go to Gregory, and I ask uh, his opinion, his views on this matter. Thank you, Michalis. So, um, bringing a bit of a um, different angle to this discussion, and maybe linking it back um, to the previous panel, coming closer to uh, green shipping and decarbonization, we see that the need to be able to make educated, quick, and factual decisions is becoming more and more important. Uh, there was a lot of mention about the new IMO uh, rules which require for a carbon intensity index to be measured and reported on uh, in the form of an annual efficiency ratio. Vessels that will be classified as A, B or C will be deemed compliant uh, nevertheless, vessels classified as D will require, um, will be given a, a three-year um, grace period to somehow uh, allow owners to bring them back into compliance, whereas vessels classified as E will um, only have one year to do so. So clearly, um, owners and operators will be in a position to um, uh, have to make quick educated and informed decisions, uh, not only for the longer strategic um, term, but also in, in the shorter term. Uh, thinking about options, obviously, uh, apart from um, um, using alternative fuels um, with lower emissions, um, some of the options include uh, making technical adjustments, so um, cleaning uh, uh, or, or treating the hull for uh, optimized um, flow of water around the hull, uh, polishing and uh, adjusting uh, propellers and so on. Some of these options may, may also be um, uh, quite uh, relatively uh, expensive. Um, an alternative uh, approach or option, if you like, uh, is thinking about changing the way the vessels operate. So even uh, matching vessels or vessel types to particular routes, taking into account total uh, weight carried, um, distance and port calls, uh, can actually uh, affect and increase the uh, CII rating. If we consider to that uh, possibly the option of using data to um, uh, also take into account weather conditions, the depth of the water traveled in, uh, can have even more significant double digit eff efficiencies. So data can really be a significant ally uh, in um, the, the need for, for improved um, and quicker factual decision making. Vessels these days are equipped with um, uh, sophisticated um, uh, sensors capable of collecting a wide range of uh, very detailed data on the uh, technical state of uh, the vessel, but also of the operation of the vessel. So being in a position to collect 
uh, and analyze with advanced techniques this data, possibly even combining with additional data which is widely available uh, both in internal and external data sources, means that um, uh, shipping companies will be in a position to um, better understand, trim, and optimize whether it's maintenance, whether it is um, uh, uh, route optimization, and so on, having not only um, compliance, uh, meeting compliance goals, but also um, to, to the benefit of, of commercial um, uh, targets. And uh, we, we are not seeing, uh, for the moment at least, as much usage of data for, for such benefits. Obviously, um, such optimizations will not reach the um, net zero target, but we see it playing a key role in this transition period. And sort of in favor of time, I think it's important to mention that having such data uh, at hand and having the ability to monitor and um, and, and have the transparency that, that data gives. Um, it's also um, a, a way to leverage this data for uh, transition funding, uh, whether it is um, uh, sustainability-linked loans, green bonds, and so on. Working alongside the financial institutions, we see that this is definitely linked with being able to monitor and uh, report on a regular basis or on a, a series of ESG-related uh, KPIs. And last but not least, um, this transparency brought through data is um, something that uh, contributes to, to being more competitive uh, in the eyes of... Uh, of um, uh, charterers. So large charterers, listed charterers, they also have their own ESG um, targets. The more um, shipping companies can align with these targets uh, gives an obvious uh, competitive advantage. Thank you, Gregory. So we place on the table three options, alternative fuels, carbon capture techniques, and some uh, data collection, analysis, and optimization. I have one question for all of you, and be brief, because I would like to cover uh, a couple of more things. Based on what we discuss, in your opinion, starting with Claire, what is the most promising development to reduce greenhouses? Otherwise, if you bet your money, where would you bet? Uh, thank you. Um, just to follow on from what you said, energy efficiency underpins the transition. So in the choices we're making for our own ships, the first thing is how, how much more efficient can we make them through choosing technologies such as air lubrication, shaft generation, wind technologies. That would be my first thing. The second thing is what is the lowest carbon fuel that we can use today? So we are obviously choosing LNG. In terms of R&D, one of our main focuses in terms of the ship itself is on fuel cells. You said brief. Thank you. Uh, Gregory? I think I'll be even more brief. Uh, in terms of investing in digitalization uh, and data, I think that is the most secure and possibly uh, mandatory investment. Um, uh, so data is definitely the uh, new uh, oil. Costas and louder. For the long term, um, alternative fuels, definitely. Um, operation of the vessels based on uh, data collection and uh, utilization of the AI. And for the short term, um, energy saving devices and uh, data um, use for optimization on the performance. And uh, Jones? Well, uh, uh, as a classification, betting money is always uh, contradictory to the, the thing that uh, we, um, uh, uh, we can uh, represent. But <laughs> um, yeah, I would say that, um, and we have emphasized that many, many times, uh, energy efficiency is the, gr the groundwork. Everything starts from energy efficiency. Even if we all turn to zero carbon fuels, the most competitive vessel will be the most efficient vessel. Full stop. And therefore, uh, whatever we do, 
will have to start always from um, efficient designs and efficient energy efficiency in mind. Um, however, uh, where would actually money be uh, bet and where, where should be money be invested? Well, um, we're talking about the whole value chain of energy transition and I was just uh, doing some very uh, rough notes here about what are the elements of that energy transition and where this ma capital investment should actually go. And it's, it's, it's a multitude of things from, from the production, from renewable energy to scale up, from biomass distribution points, from CO2 capturing units, CO2 on, uh, on shore, CO2 on board, um, uh, it, the electrical grid uh, development and, uh, and, uh, and optimization, vessels that need to be retrofitted with the energy efficiency technologies that we just mentioned or new construction with uh, alternative fuels that would actually have an impact on the capacity on yards and the capacity on vendors then this is something that we have to consider if we want to reach the number of in a base case scenario of uh, around 70 percent of the global fleet operating in low carbon fuels and also you have other things that you have to consider ports infrastructure we're talking about co2 capturing storage uh, sequestration points. Uh, here in Europe, we have a major, major issue with that. How do we in invest and where do we invest? So um, we are talking, and you will see us talking a lot this year about critical resources um, and the critical resources for the energy transition. Uh, and I think this is a discussion that is worth having. Thank you, George. Final question to all. Be brief like 10-15 seconds. Who pays for all of this? Whatever the option is, who pays? IMO, governments, EU, the ship owner, the society, everybody? Claire, brief and to the point, who pays for all of this to have the climate saved? In the end, it's all of us as consumers who will end up paying but to unlock it at a reasonable price requires the cooperation of the entire value chain and everyone playing a part. Uh, Gregory. Yeah, so I um, absolutely agree. Um, I, I think um, it, I, I've also already mentioned um, the, the link to, to getting sustainable finance. Um, how important this is and also um, optimizing to make sure that whatever the bill is, is, is as low as possible. Thank you. Costas. Okay, um, I will agree with Claire that the end, that the, end the consumer will pay and uh, I'm also a supporter of the opinion that the ship owners should not be the one who will pay the whole bill. Okay, ship owners have paid a lot of money the last 10 years at least on this uh, new environmental regulations. So I think that then uh, a distribution between uh, all the mentioned parties, ship owner, uh, IMO or EU, there are a lot of green funds and the consumer should share the bill. And George? Well, who pays for everything that I just mentioned previously, right? Um, well, um, I, I agree. At the end of the day, it's going to be all of us, the end consumer. Um, uh, but uh, the devil is in the details when these new types of schemes are emerging, and that's what we have to dig deeper into. Thank you all, and let me have the final word. Just if I want to summarize the two most important points of this panel, is that practical and feasible today is the LNG. So work with LNG, use it as a fuel, and find solution whatever uh, emissions or etc. are produced that they are carbonized to reduce them further. That was one of the main. And the second thing came from the last question, who pays? Because all of us will pay, it is time that shipping to become a very broad industry of partnership. So all stakeholders cooperate for the best and most advantageous outcome in technology, in developments, improving system, making ships safer, op efficient, operate efficiently, environmentally friendly, for the benefit of all of us, since all of us we pay. 
Thank you. And please applaud our panelists for this very broad and difficult subject. And I'll see you at the next Capital Link. Thank you.